this is how you train your mind. You mm. basically tell it what you want by saying this is important to me. Start looking for it. You'll yes. Start seeing it. Yes. And by the way, this is also why it's important to do a thing where you're like, boom, I found it. See? Yes. And then it makes your mind do more. This is why it comes back to the positive affirmation. I'm, if you yes. start to high five yourself and tell yourself that you deserve to be happy and you deserve to be fulfilled, you will start to see. I think you gotta have a dream. The school of greatness. Really? <laughs> yeah. Please welcome Lewis Howes. I'm curious about manifesting. Mm -hmm. You've been really good at manifesting results in your life, yeah. especially since the the last book. Uh, what is your thoughts on how to manifest? Yeah. Or the Everyone's doing it wrong. That's my thoughts. Okay. Yeah. Then how how should we manifest? The, the dreams that we have inside of us. Okay. And what's your thoughts about the law of attraction on how to apply it the right way or? Yeah, I think, well, I think the law of attraction and manifesting are the same thing. Mm -hmm. So law of attraction for everybody who has not read The Secret is simply your thoughts become things. Mm -hmm. And it's true. We've talked all about how when you have a negative self-talk, it tends to draw more of that to you. I think about it like lint in a dryer. Once negative stuff starts to collecting, it collects a lot more. We can also talk about your brain filter, something called the reticular activity system and how it is a live network that filters the brain. We'll dig into that deeper, but let's do surface level right now, manifesting law of attraction. So here's what everybody gets wrong about manifesting. Everybody, at least kind of in the mass market, what you're trained to think about when you think about manifesting is vision boards. Mm -hmm. And when you hear the word vision boards, you think about the big stuff. Should you have big dreams? Of course you should. Should you dream of building a mansion on the ocean if that's your thing? Yes. Should you dream of the <laughs> log cabin? Yes. If you want a Lamborghini or the new Ford Bronco, should you put? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. If you want the family, if you want the body, should you think about? Yeah, absolutely. Here's where everybody goes wrong. You dream about the end, you make this gorgeous collage of all this stuff that has nothing to do with your current life. <laughs> yeah. That literally, as you're sitting in your studio apartment with the cat box that hasn't been <laughs> changed in two weeks. No food in the fridge. No yeah. food in the fridge. And you're looking for a job and you're staring at a mansion going, someday, <laughs> it's gonna make you feel like a loser. Yeah. Because the gap between where you are and where you wanna go it seems insurmountable. And so what happens based on the research is when you only visualize the end game, Lewis, it's demotivating. Mm. At first it's really fun to like have a bottle of wine and make your like collage, I'm gonna visualize, I'm gonna slap this up, there's my vision board, it's fabulous, law of attraction baby, come on, I'm gonna think about it, it's gonna come to me. Okay, I've been doing this for two days. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm still in this apartment with the cat box that needs to be changed. The way to visualize properly is to visualize the bridge between where you are and where you need to go. The bridge. Yes, and particularly the horrible stuff. Mm. So let's use your example of the marathon. The vision board would be Lewis crossing. <laughs> the arms up the yeah, metal. the arms up the yes. metal, exactly. The high fives, high yeah, fives. I did it. Yes, I did it, exactly. That will not help you. Because when you hit mile 13 on the actual race and it is sleeting rain. You're saying, why am I doing this? Yes, and it feels nothing like that thing on your vision board. You're going to start a negative dialogue. I can't do this, my knees hurt, this is not what I thought it was gonna be, I'm not ready for this, I didn't train for this, I'm running New York, I trained in LA, are you mm, running in New York? LA. Okay, good, well then at least you trained in the right weather. Yeah, yeah. So on and on and on, and you are going to tank yourself. What you do by visualizing the bridge is you train your nervous system and your mind to do the hard work. Mm -hmm. So you should visualize not crossing the finish line, but what is it like to be at mile 12 when your batteries run out on your earbuds? Yeah. No, I'm serious. Yeah. And you keep going. What's it like when your shoelace breaks and mm -hmm. now your heel is lifting and you're starting to get a blood blister at mile mm -hmm. 17? Mm -hmm. What's it feel like? when you wake up and it is pouring rain and you visualize yourself running anyway. That way, when you visualize the work, you are preparing your body for it so you're not resistant to it when it comes. Yeah, Isn't that cool? I think it's great. It's um, a story that I had, um, George St. Pierre, who's one of the greatest UFC fighters of all time. 
he said that he always puts himself in the most uncomfortable situations in practice leading up to the fight. The most, you know, the hardest situations to get himself out of. When his arms are behind his back and he's faced against the, the mat and in between the fence and he's just getting punched in the face, he's like, how do I get out of this? Right, right. He's like, visualize that and seeing how can I get through this? Yeah, yeah, when exactly. It seems, when it seems like I just want to tap out. Yes. And instead of tapping out, what's the process for figuring out how to get through it? Yeah. To then raise my hand at the end victorious. Totally. And so you are literally building up almost like this resilience and this muscle inside of you to do the work to get the thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, create the vision board, but make sure in addition to crossing the finish line, you have somebody running in the rain. Right. You have somebody who, you have an alarm clock that says 513. You have you know these images that show the mm. stuff that you don't wanna do. So like for people who wanna launch a business, for example, like a lot of people that I'm sure follow both of us are dying to launch a business or interested in being an influencer, social media, or making money online. And what you visualize are the checks or you visualize the money you're gonna make or you visualize how cool it's gonna be when you're a lifestyle entrepreneur, whatever mm. the hell it is. Don't do that. Visualize working a day job and telling your friends that you're not gonna go out tonight because you're right. working on something. Yeah. Visualize making cold calls and being told no. Visualize not going to that party because you're staying in on a Saturday and not going to the barbecue because you're putting in the work. Yeah. Visualize sitting at a seminar and learning from other people. Visualize watching YouTube videos. Visualize your first ever course failing miserably. Right. Like, literally, that's the sort of thing that you want to visualize yourself doing and pushing through because that's gonna help you do the work. Yeah. Isn't that cool? I think that's great. Yeah, yeah. visualizing. So in order to manifest what you want, don't just visualize the good things happening. Visualize the bridge, all the things it's going to take to get yes, there. Yes, and, and, and the hard parts of the bridge. Because then you're ready for it. Mm -hmm. Then you're like, I didn't expect this to be this hard. I mean, it's still going to be right, hard. Right, But you're less likely to quit. Yes. So what have you done in the last five years to help you manifest after the first book? Were you doing this as well? Or kind of once you get on a rhythm and, and build momentum, does it become easier to manifest in your opinion? Well, so I am constantly training my mind to work for me. And there's this little trick that I talk about in the book that is all sort of the beginning of having a high five attitude. Mm -hmm. And a high five attitude is the ability to catch yourself when you're going mentally low and to flip yourself back up into a high five attitude. Okay. The thing that I know to be true is that you cannot control the things around you. You can't control what's gonna happen. You can't even control how your nervous system might respond or what thoughts might pop into your head. But you can always choose what you do next and what you make it mean, right? And so that's where mm -hmm. all the power is. Yes. And so I uh, do this thing where I, this is again, it's gonna sound so dumb but it's a way for me to introduce you to the power that your mind has to change in real time. Okay. We've talked a lot about negative self-talk. And part of the reason why negative self-talk is so crippling is not only because you've repeated it for so long and now it's a pattern, but it's also because you have a filter on your brain called the reticular activity system. Mm -hmm. Okay. This puppy is the keys to everything. And, and it's remarkable that uh, most of us have never heard of it, we've experienced it, but we don't know how to use it to our advantage. Mm -hmm. So first let me tell you what the RAS does, then I'm gonna give you an example of uh, when you've experienced it in your life, and then I'm going to explain to you how to use it to get what you want in life. This okay. is like the Perfect. super attractor manifesting and it also works for, um, interrupting negative self-talk, like it's gonna supercharge all the work you're doing with the mirror and interrupting thoughts. So first let's talk about the RES. So the RES, imagine a hairnet on your brain, only it's like electric, meaning it's alive, okay? Now the RES has one job, and the job is block out 99% of what's going on and let in 1% of what's going on. Our brains at this moment in history are having to process about 34 days mm. worth of cell phone data in one day. Crazy. It's crazy. And so your RAS has a monster job. It's like a bouncer at a bar. Mm -hmm. You're not coming in, you can come in. And you've experienced this. So have you ever shopped for a car? 
Yes. Okay, so what's the last car you bought? Tesla. Oh, Tesla. Oh, fancy. Yeah, Lewis yeah. House. I like that. Well, I never had a I never had a nice car until three years ago. I had a four thousand dollar car for five years before that. Yeah, yeah. And then I was like, you know what? I have no Bluetooth. I have no it's like I just needed yeah, an upgrade. Yeah, no, I love it. It was you a deserve 1991. It. Dude, you deserve it. I had a 1991 Cadillac. You it. And I was like, okay, you deserve please buy it. a car. So I bought a Tesla, yeah. Right. And so before you thought about buying a Tesla, you drive down the road, you don't really think about it. The second uh-huh. you're like, you know, I think I'm interested in a Tesla. What do you see everywhere? Teslas. Yes, everywhere. Uh, everywhere. My husband just bought a pickup truck. I never even noticed them. Now I'm like, there are baby blue pickup <laughs> trucks everywhere. What is going on? That's the bouncer in your brain. Uh-huh. And let me tell you how this works. There are only four things that automatically get through the bouncer in your brain, the RAS. Number one, your name. So you've experienced being in a crowded place and somebody's like, you think you hear Lewis and you're like, huh, somebody call my name? That was the bouncer in your brain. The second thing that always gets let in is any threat to your safety. So there are loud noises all all the time, but only ones in close proximity make you go like this. Mm -hmm. That was the bouncer in your brain letting it in. The third thing that gets let in is when you sense that your partner is interested in sex with you or somebody else. You're like, Chris, you know, uh-huh. who are you looking? Stop looking at her. You know what I'm saying? You kind of pick up on the signals. That's the bouncer in your brain. And the fourth one, and this is where, this is the billion dollar thing that everybody needs to know. The bouncer in your brain lets in whatever you think is important to you. Mm. So when you get intentional, about telling your brain what's important to you, like, I'm interested in a Tesla. Your brain's literally like, oh, let's let all the Teslas in. Come on in. Here's the downside to this. If you have told yourself that you are a bad person for the last 10 years, guess what your brain thinks is important? Mm. Examples that mean you're a bad person. Right. So I'm gonna give you a very specific example. So I personally don't think I'm a bad person. I don't think I'm perfect, but I know I do my best. I mean well. I don't have that story about myself Mm -hmm. at all. I used to, but I don't. And um, let's say I oversleep and I miss the dentist. I miss the dentist appointment. I'm like, oh, I got to pay the 25 bucks. I got to reschedule that thing. That kind of blows. That's all I think. And then I go on. My daughter, who constantly beats herself up and says she's a bad person, This is a real example, by the way. She oversleeps, misses a dentist appointment, and it becomes, see, I always screw everything up. Uh I'm a terror, I'm always messing things up. I'm a bad, like everything that gets let in confirms that you're a bad person. She finds proof and evidence. Yes, that's the bouncer in your mind. I'm here to tell you that when you get intentional about what you want to think about yourself, it changes in Mm. real time what your brain lets in and what it doesn't. That helps you with the other things that you're doing. The high five in the mirror, the I'm not thinking about that, the pathetic mantra. Hey, you know, just because I missed the dentist appointment doesn't mean I'm a bad person. I'm doing the best I can here. Give myself a break. High five. You know what I'm saying? Shake it off. Get back in there. Um, (laughs) It's true, right? Right. Because it's these little things Somebody cuts you off. Somebody reaches for the last thing of cereal that you wanted to buy at the grocery mm-hmm. store. You think it's like a sign that the world's out to get you. This is all your story and your mind skewing the world to prove all of the stuff you keep repeating. And the only way to get a handle on it is to start acting the opposite. Like high five yourself, even though you don't feel like it. Interrupt the crap that you keep saying. Put your hands on your heart and settle your body down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All of these things are things that somebody does when they care about themselves. When they think they deserve to be treated with kindness. Yes. When they think they deserve support. And when they realize they need it. And when you start to build yourself back up, you'll show up very differently in other relationships. Absolutely. You know, if you tolerate this kind of treatment from yourself, you'll tolerate it from other people. Mm-hmm. It does begin with you. And when you create boundaries and you don't abandon yourself, then you won't abandon yourself with other people either. You won't let them cross the boundaries. Correct. Like if you stand in front of the mirror every single morning and you're like, I look like crap. I am not good enough. I'm unhappy with my life. And then you step into a relationship and somebody leaves you on red and they ghost you for three days. Like you come to expect that. 
because that's how you believe you think you deserve to be treated. When you stand in front of a mirror and you're like, hey, you're awesome. We got this. I got you. I know it's hard. You know, we're going to go do this. Or, hey, this is a big day today. I, I've got this huge presentation. I am going to destroy this. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. you know, like you get into it. You're excited. Like, then you're creating momentum mm -hmm. for yourself. Yeah. Otherwise, what? You're going to stand there and be like, oh, my God, I screwed this up. I'm not prepared. Da, 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 da. Like, it's, it's like the negative morning routine. Mm -hmm. right. It leads to negative actions. Absolutely. So this training thing, training your RES. So here's mm -hmm. what I want you to do. Starting tomorrow, after you wake up and make your bed and kind of settle your nervous system and high-five yourself after setting your intention. So now you're like sending yourself into your morning routine in a totally different way with a calm down nervous system, an intention, and this boost of feeling supported and loved and celebrated. Um, I want you to find one naturally occurring heart shape as you go through your day. Mm, I saw could, this in your book. Yeah. yeah, it could be a stone. It could be a leaf on the ground. It could be a cloud shape. It could be a coffee stain. Uh, it could be an oil stain on the floor of a garage. It could be a spot on a dog walking by. I want you to tell your mind, let's find a heart. Let's see if we can find a heart. And something weird's going to happen. You're going to see something. And then I want you to literally supersize what's going on in your brain. And what you do is when you see the heart, I want you to then take a moment and literally congratulate yourself, like feel like, oh my God, I found it. Like whatever you believe in God, the universe, like greater connection, you put that there for me and I found it. Mm. And I want you to feel this kind of wave of, that's kind of cool. Yeah. I just saw a heart. And then that positive thing, remember how I told you, the bouncer in your brain pays attention to what's important to you. Mm -hmm. When you get your nervous system celebratory involved, that makes your brain really pay attention. Just like trauma makes your brain pay attention. It does. So you supercharge the experience by celebrating it and then look for another one around. I see hearts all day long. Yeah. And what happens when you start to play this game is you will start to realize you are walking by an entirely different world every single day because you're not looking for it. Mm -hmm. There are opportunities, there are signs, there are mile markers on your path that you are literally tuning out. Yes. And we can all sit in this moment, Lewis, and look back and see how the dots of our life connect us here. The coolest thing about practicing the high five habit, this training of finding hearts and the high five attitude, is that you start to ground yourself in the idea that this too is a dot on the map of your life and it is leading you somewhere incredible. Mm -hmm. And when you start to have that kind of high five attitude, that there are signs, whether it's the little hearts that you're now seeing or it's your ability to catch guilt or people pleasing or insecurity or the negative self-talk and be like, nope, not going down, not thinking about that, five, four, three, two, one. Let's get that high five attitude back. I can, I can do this. I, I can have my own back. It's not yeah. going to be perfect, but I can keep going. And you were just talking about how you never truly learned how to love yourself in your own skin. And you started this daily ritual, this habit of high-fiving yourself in the mirror. Yeah. How, I mean, you're, you've, lived a, <laughs> you've lived a pretty full life right now, but you feel like really you've never truly learned how to love yourself, but now you feel like you know how to? Yes. I do. Why did you not know how to love yourself in the first place? Who? that's a big question. Um, I think that most of us are not taught how to love ourselves just for being alive. For existing. For existing, thank you. It's always like we have to accomplish something. Correct. Then we can get love. Yes, it's, it's the same thing with happiness. Like you're chasing it and you think that if you achieve something, you're going to get it. And you also, or at least I felt the most loved when I was little, when I was achieving something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that most parents kind of fall into this camp. And it's really interesting to write a book about this and sort of trace back how we go from being little teeny babies that would crawl up to a mirror and put our hands up and kiss ourselves and love the sight of ourselves to being a self-loathing adult that stands in front of a mirror and either ignores or criticizes your yeah. very existence. And... 
I believe that a lot of this has to do with the fact that so much of what you learn <clears throat> as a kid is if you do what I tell you to do, then I'll like you, then I'll love you. And so much of your existence becomes complying, fitting in, not making people angry. You learn how to sort of go in and out of spaces, belong to groups, make mm -hmm. sure people like you, and you stop focusing on how you were born, which is looking in a mirror and liking yourself. So my formula mm -hmm. for being somebody that was worthy of love is, well, if I'm accomplishing all this stuff, then I'm lovable. If this person over here that I love loves me back, then I'm lovable. Mm -hmm. If somebody likes me, then I'm lovable. Notice where all the sources of love were coming from? Outside. Mm -hmm. But I never really understood, how do you learn how to put yourself first? How do you learn how to love yourself, Lewis? How do you do that? Mm -hmm. We know we need to, but the question is how? So how'd you learn how to, how to, how'd you learn how to unlearn it and then I guess relearn how to love yourself? Okay, so you know this is kind of my brand of advice. It's gotta be incredibly stupid on the surface. Yeah. It's gotta be so simple, it's really implausible that it works. Mm -hmm. And once you start unpacking it, it has to have a crazy bananas amount of scientific proof and real life proof in people's lives to prove why it works. Okay. So I'll tell you the story first behind the high five habit. Because I did not set out and go like, oh, okay, I've written the five second rule book. I need to come up with another five. I have been toiling away with what book to write for nearly five years. Yes. So it's been five years since I've had a book in print. And um, I had this random morning where there's a lot going on in my life. I'm not gonna get into it because it's a boring story, but I was just having a really hard time in my life. And I woke up, got out of bed, I made my bed like I always do. I walked into the bathroom, I'm standing there brushing my teeth, and I catch my reflection in the mirror. And my first thought is, God, you look like hell. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. And I know women in particular can relate to this, but what a lot of people don't realize is you guys are incredibly hard on yourselves too. Mm -hmm. And so as I go, God, you look like hell, I start then cataloging all of the things that are wrong with my appearance. I'm like, your gray hair is coming in, you've got stripes on your neck, one of your boobs is lower than the other, you know, you look exhausted. And then as soon as you have a negative thought or a self-criticism, it's sort of like lint in a dryer. Once you start collecting it, it just keeps on collecting it. <laughs> so now I'm thinking not about how horrible I look or how tired I look. Now I start thinking about all the stuff I need to do. I start going, oh my gosh, I got up a little too late and I've got a Zoom mm. call in eight minutes. I don't even have a bra on yet. The dog needs to be walked. And I could feel my energy mm. going yeah. <laughs> down. Like yes. I just felt the weight of the world on my shoulders. Yeah. Overwhelmed, uncertain. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it doesn't even matter what was going on in my life at that time because I think it's a universal feeling to feel overwhelmed by your life at times. Yes. And so here I am, a motivational speaker. Unmotivated. Yeah. Unmotivated, <laughs> uncaffeinated, oh, yeah. no brawn, standing there in my underwear with my dog at my feet. I don't know what came over me. But as cheesy as it sounds, I just raised my hand and gave the tired, haggard woman in the mirror <laughs> a high five. Mm -hmm. And it didn't change my life like right then and there, but something shifted. Mm. Like I felt a little lighter. I felt like I wasn't alone. Mm -hmm. I felt like, okay, you know, this moment in your life is hard, but you can do this, Mel. And I went on with my day. So the second day, um, I woke up, and this is when things started to really kind of churn in my mind. The, the first thing that I noticed was this. So I wake up, Lewis, and I make my bed. And I realized I was looking forward mm. to that moment in the mirror where I was gonna mm -hmm. see myself. Now yeah. look, I'm 52 years old. I will probably have a hot flash during the middle of this interview at some point. <laughs> I'm a lot older than you. Just, but, don't eat, just don't eat lobster. Yeah, oh yeah, I, I know I had a really <laughs> allergic reaction the last time we were together, wow. Um, but I have spent the first 45 years of my life 
either criticizing the woman in the mirror mm -hmm. or ignoring her. And this was the first time that I could remember that I was actually looking forward to mm. seeing myself. Sort of like, you know, when I was coming here today, you and I are very good friends. As I was walking into the building, I'm feeling excited to see you. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't like I was feeling excited to my, see myself. Like, I'm not like, yeah, because I got a lot of crap going on in my life. But I felt a little bit like I'm about to see a friend. And so that second mm. morning, I high five myself again. And again, I feel something shift. I feel a little, just a little lightness in the mood and I go on with my day. So the third morning, I do it again. And again, like lightness. And so I keep doing it, keep doing it. A couple weeks go by. And now I'm starting to feel a little bit of momentum. And I'm really enjoying it. I have no idea what the hell is going on. I'm, I haven't even done this in front of my husband, Chris, yet. Because mm. let's be honest. Standing in front of a mirror. <laughs> High five yourself. Yeah, like, right. come on. How pathetic does it get? You're like, it's really, is your life that bad? <laughs> so um, I snap a photo of myself. I've got my retainer in. I got bed head. Like, I, I, I'm not looking glamorous. I did not expect this to be the photo that would ignite a movement. Mm -hmm. And within an hour, I posted on my story on, on Instagram. Within an hour, at least 100 people tag me. Mm. All over the world. People high-fiving the mirror with their kids. People on a submarine high-fiving it in the military. Pe wow. People MMA. Like just, and I thought, okay, wait a minute. Maybe I'm not the only one that needs a little boost in the morning. Maybe I'm not the only one who feels alone. Maybe I'm not the only one that is missing a sense of encouragement and control and confidence in an overwhelming moment in my life. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's something here. And then the messages started to come in. Whoa, Mel, like I have been using this for, for five days. This woman wrote to us, Lewis, she's had body dysmorphia for 20 years. Mm. Has not been able to look at herself in the mirror. Five days of doing this high five. And she said, I can look at myself and I even see beyond the body, I see the person. Mm. And I can grin. Mm. Wow. We had a woman who wrote to us who said that she was in a domestic violence shelter. She had uh, escaped a very abusive relationship. She had seen me talking at our friend Jamie Kern Lima's uh, event. She started doing the high five thing. She DMs us and she says that, you know, I have childhood trauma. I've just been in a physically abusive relationship. I've lost everything. I'm in a domestic violence shelter. What this high five in the mirror is teaching me is that I still have myself. Mm. And so that was when I said, I got to figure out what's going on. Right. And I started to unpack the research and the research around this simple ritual. I love that you called it a ritual because I want people to habit stack this with brushing their teeth. Right. This is so life changing. It's so simple. The science here is like, pow, you can't believe it. And once I unpack it, you're going to be like, I can't believe how cool this thing is. Right. So what's the science say? Okay. So the science, <laughs> let's start with the, the first thing. So the first thing is that when you first try it, okay, you will um, not be able to raise your hand and high five yourself and be like, you suck, Mel, or today's going to be terrible. And there's a reason for that. Uh, and the reason is that for your entire life, you have given other people high fives. So when you give a high five or you receive one, what is a high five? Just the, the gesture alone. What does is, what is this communicate if we do this to each other? We high five. Nice job. Good work. You're doing amazing. Yeah. Keep it up. Yeah. I believe in you. I love yeah. you. Let's go. If you blow a shot, you got to get back in the game. A high five is like shake right, it off. Right. You can win. Yes. And so all of that lifetime of high fiving other people and the messaging associated with it is programmed right here mm -hmm. in your subconscious brain. Right. There's a field of study called neurobics, which is about- Neurobics. Ne I, know, I, I didn't make that up. Interesting. It's interesting. Physical movement plus new neurological activity. Mm -hmm. When you marry an unexpected physical movement with new neurological activity, it's the fastest way to forge new neural pathways mm. in your brain. Okay. Okay? We know the example, you've covered this on your show, of brushing with the wrong hand and thinking positive mm -hmm. thoughts. Mm -hmm. And the reason why that works is because when you're brushing with the wrong hand, it's unexpected, your brain doesn't expect it. So instead of drifting off about the fact that you need to walk the dog, you have to focus. So your prefrontal cortex is engaged. You're not used to high-fiving your own reflection. So it's an unexpected physical movement that then 
activates all of the positive programming in your subconscious. Mm -hmm. So when you raise your hand and you high five your, tar your tired self, Lewis, what happens is all of the messaging with this, the high five, I believe in you, I love you, I celebrate you, you got this, keep going, come on. It actually fuses with your freaking reflection. Wow. It's impossible to criticize yourself. Yeah. Your brain won't allow it because it's not wired that way when you're making that motion. Right. Isn't that crazy? It's hard to say you suck. You, you, you don't matter in anything. It's hard no, to, yeah. You can't. Yeah. You can't. And so this lifetime of positive subconscious programming associated with high-fiving other people gets fused with your own reflection mm. in this ritual. That's just the beginning, okay? Wow. That's just the beginning. The second thing that um, starts to happen that's really interesting. So, you know, we've had a ton of people do this, obviously, around the world. Super easy idea. It's spreading around the world. We start interviewing people about what's going on, and this is what we notice. We notice that one of two things happen when you first try this. So here's how I want everybody to try it. You're going to go into the bathroom and you know do it before or after you brush your teeth, and that's important because I want you to make this a ritual that's yeah. part of your morning routine. And so we need to stack it with something you already do. And you're going to stand there for a minute, and I want you to look at yourself. Now that right alone, most of us don't do. Look at yourself. Right. And I want you to just think about the day ahead. This is based on more research. So recent studies show from the University of Florida that if you take just a minute and you set an intention about how the day is going to go, about who you're going to be, how you're going to show up, what's the one thing that kind of matters to you to really make, a to make, yeah. make progress on, if you just kind of set that intention, who am I going to be today? How am I going to show up today? Even if it's a hard day, how are you going to show up? and then you raise your hand and you seal it. Research shows just setting the intention alone changes your mood, it boosts your productivity, mm. it increases your ability to make an impact on other people. And so when you seal it with this high five, it becomes this ritual of setting an intention for the day mm -hmm. and also silencing the critic and reprogramming the default setting about how you see yourself, whether mm. or not you believe in yourself. And you leave that bathroom feeling like the wind is at your back. Now, when people do this for the first time, so you're gonna stand there tomorrow and you're gonna go, okay, Mel Robbins and Lewis, geez, I'm just sitting here, <laughs> brush my teeth. Okay, this is stupid. This is, you're gonna just start rejecting it. I guarantee you, this is the, the coolest stuff you're gonna have the biggest resistance to. Mm -hmm. And so for those of you that just raise your hand and do it, you're gonna immediately be like, why have I not been doing this? It feels good to be encouraged and supported. To high vibe yourself. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Why have I not had my own back? <clears throat> why do I stand here and criticize myself? Why do I allow this moment every single morning to be a moment where life takes over and I drift into autopilot? Why am I not taking this moment for me mm -hmm. to build a partnership with myself? Yeah. The second group of people, and this is the larger group, right. resist it. And resisted. this is really yeah. interesting. And the reason why you resist it, and the reason why it feels weird, is because you believe you're not worthy of support or celebration. From yourself or from others? Period. Wow. Why, so do we, if, why do we think we're not worthy of s celebration? Well, um, for people that grew up in a chaotic, violent, or whatever household, it was your lived experience. Yeah. Um, I think that for many of us, we look back on our lives and, you know, the cognitive negative bias has us focus on the things that went wrong. Mm -hmm. And so you begin to tell your sto yourself a story about your life that is basically a pyramid of all the things that you regret, of all the things that you wish it had done over, of all the things that you don't like about yourself. And so you drag that with you into the bathroom every morning yeah. and you stare at the mirror and you see somebody that has screwed up. You see somebody who's not where you're meant to be. You see somebody who doesn't have the number on the scale or the car that you wanted or the job that you had hoped for or the relationship that mm -hmm. you had always dreamed about. And so standing there, you believe you're not worthy of support or celebration. And it's this mm. deep belief. You know, we talk a lot in the personal development space of, oh, I'm not good enough. I actually think that's the polite thing that people say. I believe that people have a much more 
horrible way of talking to like themselves. Like what? I'm a, uh, I can't say it on TV, <laughs> but I can say it on the internet. I'm a piece of shit. Yeah. I'm worthless. No one will ever love me. Mm. Uh, I screwed up my life. I'm a failure. I'll never amount to anything. Mm -hmm. It's too late. I'm a bad person. Like, I think people actually say this to themselves. Yeah. And they say it over and over again. Yes. Daily. Yes. Yes. And just like ruts on a dirt road, it starts to wear in your brain and it becomes the familiar path. And so you stand in front of the mirror and, you know, I'm telling you, raise your hand and let all that positive programming you've given to everybody else. We're, we are amazing at celebrating everybody else. We cheer mm -hmm. for our favorite sports teams. We buy tickets to, you know, our favorite musicians. We throw birthday parties for people. We take on extra work for our colleagues. We help our family members out and our friends out. But when it comes to supporting ourselves, we don't know how to do it. No. In fact, there's a lot of people that think it's selfish to put yourself first mm -hmm. or that you're arrogant if you're due. Right. I'm here to tell you it is essential to your well-being, mm -hmm. to your fulfillment, to your happiness, all of it. So if you're feeling resistance, you're either going to feel it because you already have a deep story that you don't deserve it because of your track record, your past, because of what's happening in your life. Or you're going to feel resistance because you have been trained to believe that you only deserve that kind of stuff when you're winning. Like, if I don't have that car, I don't get the high five. If I didn't get that promotion, I didn't deserve it. If I am not in a loving relationship, I don't deserve to be celebrated. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not actually achieving or doing the things that warrant that. I'm here to tell you, I'm on a mission to make every human being realize that if you wake up in the morning and you're breathing, and you're standing in front of that mirror, and you have survived the stuff you have survived, and you are still waking mm -hmm. up and trying to do better, you not only deserve a high five, you need it. Mm. Because what we also know based on the research is that empowerment, support, kindness, love, celebration, it is the single most motivating force on the planet. Tough love is a bunch of baloney. Mm. What really fuels people, particularly when you're going through a challenge, is feeling celebrated, seen, and supported. And the research bears it out. Yeah, I can think of the times when I was with, uh, on sports teams where I had great, loving, encouraging coaches. It made me want to work harder from a more energized place, an abundant energy. But when I had the coaches that would just degrade you and put you down and call you names in front of your teammates mm -hmm. and make you feel bad, it would drive me to try to be better, but it was always like harder. And I never felt satisfied. I never yeah. felt fulfilled. I always felt like even when I accomplished something, it still wasn't good enough. Yeah. And then I repeat that pattern. Like, okay, I'm gonna accomplish, but it's not enough to feel loved. And so let me keep accomplishing in order to feel loved, but yeah. I still don't love myself because it's not good enough. Yeah. So let me go for the next thing. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's funny because I have a photo on my phone that my, um, my, my therapist told me to do this exercise in like eight months ago. Which was a, a strategy for me to reclaim the love for myself. So I have a photo of my, my oh. childhood self. I don't know if people can see this Look on how YouTube. Cute you are. But uh, a photo of me, this is probably when I was like five or six, maybe I was seven. But something that I've tried to, to do and really been integrating in my life is to reconnect with the child where I felt like I stopped loving myself. Okay, so let's talk about this right now. Yeah. You ready? So let me yeah. talk about this image. So. Let's talk about the Lewis this age, right. standing in front of a mirror. Yeah, and what I do is I stand in front of myself as a child. I yes. imagine myself, but to do it, ima imagine looking at the mirror as yourself. Yes. Yeah. Well, what I'm trying to say is when you were this age and you yeah. stood in front of the mirror, uh -huh. you had a totally different relationship with yourself because you still loved yourself. Yeah. You still thought exactly. that you were a great kid and you wanted all the things that the adult Lewis wants. Right. You want to feel loved, you want to feel, feel seen, mm -hmm. you want to feel heard, you want to feel like you matter. Mm -hmm. And you, in seeing yourself when you were this age, felt those things for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And what somewhere I, along the way, you lost correct. it. Correct. Yeah, yeah. And so what I'm trying to say is that when you stand in front of this mirror, exactly what Lewis is talking about, when you've got coaches that scream at you and degrade you, and, mm -hmm. and you know, sure, it makes you run faster, but it leaves its mark. 
It does. It leaves its mark. And so there's research. So let me talk about why this is so motivating, particularly because so many of the, the your audience love sports, right? So um, they did a study where they looked at NBA teams. And what they wanted to take a look at was, does fist bumps, backpack, yeah, some yeah. high fives make a difference Touch. in a team winning? Touch, right? Didn't, that, didn't they do like a 2020 special or something? I can't I remember. don't know, but if they did, I need to watch it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so like the power of touch. Uh -huh. But I think it's deeper. It's the power of encouragement. Mm, interesting. And so what they found is that in the study, at least in the years that they looked at, you could take a look at the teams that made it to the championships in the NBA, go all the way back to the preseason, and those were the teams that had the most number of fist bumps and really? back pats and high fives. Yep. Wow. And the same was true about the teams that were the lowest in the league at the end of the season. They had the least amount huh. of fist bumps, high fives, and touch. Why? So they're the least encouraging. Correct. Those sorts of gestures build trust and partnership. I'm telling you, mm -hmm. when you stand in front of a mirror and ignore yourself, you're like the losing NBA Ooh, team. Oh, interesting selfish on your own, isolated. You're not in partnership with the person you're staring at in the mm. mirror. You don't have your own back because you're ignoring yourself. Yes. There's another study, and this one is, I think, even more powerful. So they did this study where they wanted to know what's the most motivating thing to help somebody get through a really big challenge. They divide, the researchers divide kids into three groups, right? Huh. And they gave each of the groups of kids very challenging problems to work through. And they wanted to measure, okay, how resilient, how long would they work, what were their attitudes like? And then they measured it based on, well, what form of praise or support are we gonna give each one of these groups? And let's see what's the most mm. empowering. Interesting. First group gets what we know to be the fixed mindset stuff. The praise was all verbal praise and it was simply about a trait. Lewis, you are so smart. Lewis, uh, you know, you are a super student praising something that is just sort of a compliment about you. Mm -hmm. The second group of students working on a challenging problem got praise based on work ethics. So something in their control. Oh, Lewis, you're working so hard. Lewis, you got such good perseverance. Lewis, you know, you're really like just grinding away over there. Good job. Those guys did better than Lewis, you're smart. Lewis, hardworking, better. The third group, the researchers simply walked up, did not say a word and high five the kid. Really? That's it, that's it. That group literally, exponentially, huh. more motivated, worked longer, worked through more challenging problems. Now here's the big question, why? Why would a simple high five <laughs> with no verbal praise be more empowering and motivating and inspiring and develop more resilience and confidence and motivation inside somebody? And the reason why is this. Mm. A high five affirms your deepest fundamental needs. It's not just a gesture. When you high five somebody, particularly somebody who has either blown the free throw shot or is working on something difficult or going through a really hard time, when you high five them, you're saying, I see you. Mm. When you high five them during a challenge, you actually are acknowledging, I know this is hard. So the person feels heard. And because it's one to one, and you have to be really intentional. Like if you and I go to high five, like we have to focus on it. That was a good right. one. Was good. If you miss it, what do you do? You gotta do it again. Correct. Yeah. So there's an intentionality behind it. And that makes you feel like you're being affirmed as a unique individual. Mm, interesting. And so all of those things are in that one gesture. Now it goes even more. So, so there's even more here. So I was talking to our buddy, Dr. Daniel Amen, right? Uh -huh. And so one of the world's leading experts on yes. brains, he's got like 60,000 brain scans. I think, it's so, like a, I think it's like 120,000. Oh, is it at this point? crazy, yeah. So he was so excited about the high five habit. He completely geeked out. He's like, oh my gosh, yes, yes, yes. He's like, yes, neurobics. Yes, 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 yes. So we then, he said, let me tell you what else is going on, Mel. And I'm like, really? There's more? <laughs> He said, yeah, he said, you know how when you do it, you, you said you felt like a little kind of boost. boost in your mood. He said, well, there are two things going on there. He said, first of all, when you cross a finish line in a race, what do you do? Put your hands up. Yeah. What do you do when your favorite you team scores? You high five someone. Yeah, yeah, you high five somebody. What do you do at a, at a musical concert? You, yay. What do you do? You know, you're raising your hand in celebration when you high five somebody or fist bump them or put your arm around them. That raised arm gesture in a positive sense 
triggers your nervous system mm. to tingle with celebration. It's the energy of celebration, even mm. if you're going through something difficult. And even more, you get a dopamine drip when mm -hmm. you do this. Mm -hmm. And so part of the reason why you feel this kind of shift in your mood and you feel a little bit of like, oh, okay, I, I, I can do, I can face this, I can do this, I got this, is because of the dopamine, it's because of the nervous system, right. and it's because of all of this positive programming associated with that gesture. Isn't that crazy? That's powerful. That's powerful. I mean, well, so what does someone do, though, if they just constantly have the negative self-talk in their mind that they're no good? Do they go in front of the mirror, you know, every 10 minutes and do this? No. Or is there another strategy behind the negative self-talk? Well, okay. So first things first, definitely make this high five in the mirror a habit, okay? Mm -hmm. So start practicing it. Give it five to 10 days and start to see what happens. The second thing that you can do with negative self-talk okay, is you need to start to interrupt it. Mm. So the thing about negative self-talk is that it is typically something you've engaged in since you were yay high. And in addition to it being wired into your brain, it is also something that can get triggered by your nervous system in stressful situations. And so the first step, and we can talk more about the filter in your brain and how the filter in your brain is causing you to stay stuck in a lot of this negative self-talk and yeah. how to use your mind to help you. But the first step is you got to do the awful part of getting self-aware yes. of what the voice is saying. And the way that you do that, there's a couple techniques that you can use to create what uh, researchers or psychologists call objectivity you want to separate yourself from the voice. Yep. So you can do what Lewis is doing. He's writing down right now in a journal. You can keep just a little notebook with you and you can kind of catalog when your attitude tanks and oh. what are you actually saying to yourself, yeah. okay? So should we write down all the things we're saying? You could. Negative about ourselves? You too? can, you can. I personally do it this way. I start to notice when I feel down or I start to notice when my energy drops. And then I tune into what I'm thinking about. And if it's negative, I go, okay. five, four, three, two, one. Yeah. I literally notice, oh, you're sitting there thinking you're a bad person again. Oh, you're sitting there thinking that uh, somebody's mad at you again. Oh, you're sitting there thinking that you screw everything up again. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're sitting there thinking that you uh, that nothing ever works out for you. Oh, inter oh you're sitting there thinking that uh, you, you've blown it. Interesting. And then I go, five, four, three, two, one. And I go, I'm not thinking about that. That's the most basic technique to use because what I want you to do, since this is like operating on autopilot, it's encoded right here. When you're not really thinking, this is what's running, kind of like the soundtrack of your life. When you just start to notice that you have a thought that's not helping you, you can't control that it popped up, but guess what you can do? You can smack it down. Yeah. And so I use the five second rule, which we've talked about a lot on your show. Count backwards, five, four, three, two, one. The counting backwards awakens your prefrontal cortex. It gives you a moment of control. And then the way to build distance, Lewis, is say, I'm not thinking about that. And here's why. You're so used to thinking this way, I can't just say, stop thinking you're fat and start thinking that you love your body. <laughs> right. It's not gonna happen. Yes. It's not gonna happen. Right, right. So you've gotta go, oh, there I am. I'm trashing the way that I look. I'm telling myself that I'm overweight. I look like shit. I'm hideous. Nobody's gonna love me. Be like, five, four, three, two, one. I am not thinking about that. It's an act of defiance. Mm. See, I want you to go from these negative thought patterns to a more positive, empowering, high five attitude. Mm. Because if you continue to live in, I'm fat, I'm unworthy, no one's gonna love me, I've screwed up my life, that will be your life. Right. And the trick on this is, I'm not saying change your thoughts and unicorns appear. <laughs> I'm saying change your thoughts so you stop the 24-7 beatdown yeah. and learn how to lift yourself up so that you can face the things that are going on in your life and so that you can take the actions that you need to take to change your life. Because the reason why you're not changing is not because you're not capable. It's not because of the trauma or your past or anything else. It's because of the beatdown. That's why you're not changing. Yeah, it's draining. It's draining. It's demoralizing. 
it is, it, and, mm. and by the way, if you constantly are like, I'm unlovable, I'm worthy, I'm this, I'm that, why on earth would you feel motivated or do you think you deserve to change? If that's the, the thing in your mind, mm -hmm. it doesn't work. And so pay attention. When you feel your energy go negative, be like, oh, okay, what am I, th oh, whoa, that's disgusting. Five, four, three. I'm not thinking about that. You don't have to insert anything else. Let's just practice shutting it the hell up. Right. The second thing you can do is once you kind of get good at interrupting it, I want you to um, name, like let's turn it into a character. So I did this with our son Oakley when he was struggling pretty profoundly with uh, uh, anxiety when he was in the fifth grade. Uh, he named his anxiety mm. Oliver. Mm. And then we asked him to describe Oliver. And Oliver uh, was like this pimply face kid that, <laughs> uh, what is that, um, the diary of the wimpy kid kind yeah, of yeah, bully yeah. looking kid? And whenever the negative worries and stuff would come up, he would literally, you could literally hear him go, Oliver, shut up. <laughs> and it is the ability, what's happening when you name it and picture the person is that you're able to detach yourself mm -hmm. from that voice in your mind that's talking. Because that voice is typically a caregiver that either talked to you that way or talked to themselves yes. that way or yes. some bully or some trauma experience or some nasty coach that beat this into your head. It's from somebody else. And mm -hmm. so we want you to separate yourself so you can be like, oh, that's what Oliver sounds like. That's not actually how I want to talk to myself. Right. And so identifying it, interrupting it, and then you can get into the really incredible magic of rewiring your brain to work for you. Yeah, I think uh, Ethan, Ethan Cross, who's a psychologist out of the University of Michigan, has a book called Chatter, mm. which is about all the different psychological strategies for eliminating the negative self-talk and improving the quality of your mind. And he says, start coaching yourself just like you would have a great coach coaching you. Have someone like a character in your mind coaching right. you, celebrating you right. with your self-talk to yeah. help you kind of shift out of that by interrupt it, then coach yeah, yourself. Yeah, what would Lewis say to me? What would Mel say yeah, to yeah. me? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and, and here's the tricky part of this. So the tricky part of this is that um, I personally think most mantras are also complete garbage. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say that is because you don't freaking believe them. Right. So if you think you're worthless, you're never going to be able to stand in front of a mirror and change your life by going, I'm worthy. Because your brain's like, who, no, you're who, not. Yeah. no, you're not. We, we've, been, we've been talking about this for your life. You're not yes. worthy. You don't want me to show you something. So you have to interrupt it. And if you're going to try to replace it, what you need to do are two things. Number one, you have got to come up with, I should have called it pathetic mantra because it would have been easier to remember. Uh -huh. In the book, I called it a meaningful mantra. We should just call it a pathetic mantra. You need to come up with something that's like, okay. You know, like if you're really <laughs> like bad and you think you're a horrible person, like don't make your mantra, I'm amazing. Make your mantra like, I'm doing the best I can. Yeah. That's it. Like Something simple. Yeah, you can believe that, right? You can mm -hmm. believe that. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying, you know, I, I'm not meaning to screw up. I'm doing the best I can. Like that, that I believe. Yeah. And that's, a, that's better than, boy, I'm the best in the world right now. Yeah, yeah. no, that, you're yeah. never gonna believe that. Yeah. Ever, ever, ever. Like for example, if you struggle with, with health and weight and stuff, it's probably gonna be hard for you to stand in front of a mirror and be like, I love my body, because you've been rejecting it. So instead, look at yourself in the mirror mm -hmm. and use a meaningful mantra. I deserve to feel healthy. Right. And I'm gonna treat myself in a way that proves it. Yeah. That's it, that's different. It's different because it's believable. The only other thing that will change the way that you're, you think is behavioral activation therapy. So there's a lot of the tools in this book that are grounded as a baseline in the body of research yeah. around behavioral activation therapy, which I know you talk about all uh -huh. the time on the show, which is basically act like the person you want to become. Right. If you want to be more like Lewis, act like Lewis. Follow his morning routine, mm -hmm. take his advice, interrupt the garbage, Oliver, in your head. Five or three, I'm not talking to you, Oliver. What would Lewis say to me? How would Lewis talk to Lewis? Mm -hmm. And start to act like the person you wanna become and something interesting happens. And this is why the high five works, by the way, because it is an action. Mm -hmm. You are acting like somebody right. who believes in and loves themselves. Yeah.
that's why it works. Uh -huh. Move into motion. Don't just think only, but move yes. and act so, on it. So when you see yourself, you know, we always talk about positive morning routines. Let's talk about negative ones, okay? Because your negative patterns are the reason why you have right. horrible self-talk. Right. Like when I was in law school, I hated my life. My anxiety was out of control. I was out of control. I hated law school. And so my behavior actually reflected my state of mind. Mm. I would wake up hungover. I would immediately think, oh my God, I'm late. I would then reach for a cigarette and light it. Then I would run around the apartment getting dressed and trying to find everything because nothing was organized. I would then quickly drive to Dunkin' Donuts, even though I had no time to stop for coffee. I'd get a big old coffee with, with four sugars and two creams. Mm. Smoking another cigarette on the way, speeding my whole way there. Then I would sit in class, be panic stricken about being called on. Same thing again. <laughs> then I would sit at lunch, pick at a salad, gossip with friends, avoid the homework. Then I would go to the library, procrastinate forever. Then I would drive home, split a bottle of wine with my roommate, fall asleep, wow. wake up, repeat. When you see somebody's actions, you can typically predict just how bad they're trapped in their mind. Absolutely. But I think we all are. I mean, I think even people that have healthy habits don't have a healthy relationship with themselves. That your self-talk is ground zero. Mm -hmm. Because how you talk to yourself, what you think about yourself when you look in the mirror, that sort of default setting in your mind, geez Louise, I mean, it, it makes me really sad, honestly. I was, I, I gave my first speech uh, in two years because of the pandemic uh, yesterday in Salt Lake. And um, there was a book line. And even though everybody had masks and they were six feet away, you could see the pain in people's eyes, mm. the isolation, the sadness, the overwhelm, the feeling of uncertainty. Yeah. And I think that people are feeling way more uncertain and afraid than they're actually saying right now. Mm. That the sustained amount of change that we've been having to manage, yeah. it's too much, you know, it's a lot. And if you stand in front of the mirror and you can't see somebody that's worth supporting through this, you're just gonna continue to go down. Because the one person mm. that you spend your whole life with is you. Yes. And this is the relationship you need to be working on. Like you want, you want to be loved? You better learn how to love yourself. Mm -hmm. You want to feel worthy? Stop looking for it out there and treat yourself like you're worthy. How do you do that? Well, by pushing through the resistance and raising your hand. Like if you can't freaking high five your reflection. <laughs> right. You can't, you can't, you can't do that. How the hell are you going to make things happen in your life? If you don't think you are worthy of support and celebration, particularly when life is hard. Yeah, how are you going to believe that other people are going to do that for you as well? If you can't do it for yourself, why would other people Well, actually, this is why people's relationships don't work out. Hmm. Because you're looking outside yourself for the things you actually need. For validation. Correct. You are chasing people and seeking validation in romantic relationships and that will end when you can stand in front of that mirror and validate yourself. Mm -hmm. When you build yourself up, when you support yourself, you show up totally differently for everybody else. When you know that you can have your own back, you're not gonna be looking for the validation from your boss or your friends or all these other things. People have problems with boundaries because they can't look themselves in the eye. So how the hell are they gonna look somebody else in the eye and say, actually, this doesn't work for me? What about when things start to shift and we start to see, oh, here's a great potential relationship I could get into or I got a great job opportunity or something's coming my way. How do we learn to not self-sabotage the good things that come to us? So give me an example. Like how have you self-sabotaged things in your life? Um, I can't think of a good answer. I don't think I really do that that much, <laughs> but I know, I know that other people do and it's a big issue. Um, maybe... I'm trying to think. Okay, so I'll tell you. But if people get into like, a good this, relationship. This is a really like, big answer though. Yeah, you yeah, ready? Yeah. Okay, so now let's detour into the lane. We talked about this some the last time I was on. But let's detour into the lane of anxiety, of patterns and trauma, uh -huh. and talk about why people self-sabotage. Yes. People don't self-sabotage intentionally. 
nobody wakes up in the morning and says, today, I'm going to screw up my life. Right. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to drink myself on the ground. I'm going to cheat on my wife. I'm going to embezzle for my company. Mm -hmm. I'm going to lie to everybody about how I'm actually feeling. I'm going to stop taking my meds. I'm going to kick the dog. Like Nobody does that. What happens is people get triggered. And they react. And yeah. then they fall into old patterns. Mm -hmm. And so what happens, I believe, in relationships in particular, or jobs, where you're like, this time it's going to be different is it's different for the first three to six months when it's novel mm -hmm. and when you're intentional and when everything counts. But then when you gotta face yourself. Then when it becomes <laughs> like part of your life, you get lazy and you yeah. slip into old patterns. Or when the stakes get really high. Let's say you're somebody who had a parent die early or your dad abandoned the family and you're scared to love somebody. And so you fall deeply for somebody. And then what gets triggered is this tremendous fear that they're going to leave. Yeah. Because that's your lived experience. And if you go back to what you did as a child to cope with that fear that somebody's going to leave, that's the exact pattern that you will repeat as an adult. Mm -hmm. The only way to end this or to try to get your arms around it is to attack it holistically. Because so much of this happens at the subconscious level, and it also it gets triggered first by your nervous system, and yeah. you're not even aware of it. Right. And so there's a tool that I uh, talk about in this book called High Five in Your Heart. Your and heart. Your heart. Yep. So you you uh, what you do, and, and and I started doing this because I was having this incredible uh, response from past trauma happen mm. when the pandemic hit. So when the pandemic hit, uh, I started waking up feeling like something was terribly wrong. And I would, it would start my ankles and it would flood up my legs and go all the way up my body and I would feel this wave come up. My immediate thought is something's wrong. Mm. And my heart would start to race and I'd feel this full on like anxiety response. And I know what that is now. So I now know that the anxiety response of waking up, which so many people do, this is really actually very, very common. People wake up anxious. Yes, feeling like they're in trouble, or something's wrong, mm. or something's about to go wrong. Yeah, that's not good. Well, if you grew up in a chaotic household. That's normal. Yep, yeah. if you had a caregiver that gave you the silent treatment, Ooh. or had mental illness, or had a drinking problem, or if there was abuse in your or, house, yeah. yep, you did wake up. Anxious. And, yeah, because your anxiety, by the way, was trying to protect you. It mm -hmm. was putting you in a state of being alert so that you were ready in case something happened. But right. for a ton of us, Lewis, we have lived our whole lives with a dysregulated nervous system. That's what I've come to learn during the pandemic, that I have literally lived since probably the fourth grade with my nervous system never truly resetting back to a calm resting state. Mm. And so I started to wake up every morning in the pandemic, like so many people did. But, and I've always kind of had this sort of wake up and feeling like something's wrong. Like, uh-oh, you know, Chris is mad. Like my first thing is like, Chris is already up, he's meditating, he's angry that I've slept 15 minutes longer than him. Like, it's so stupid, you know, this is how we torture ourselves. <laughs> but during the pandemic, it was like a full on anxiety response. And so I started doing this thing where I would put my hands on my heart, like mm. right in the center of my chest. I got yep. big mitts just like you, so yes. you can kind of hit the whole thing. Take a deep breath, and then I would say, I'm okay, I'm safe, I'm loved. Mm -hmm. If you can say those things, in this moment it's true. You are okay, mm -hmm. you are safe, and you are loved, whether you're waking up in a mansion or a homeless shelter. Mm -hmm. And what would happen as I was doing this, high-fiving my heart, is you're pressing on the vagus nerve. Like that's what you're actually toning. That's the same thing that uh, Wim Hof is teaching with the ice bath. You're mm -hmm. toning your vagus nerve. And what the vagus nerve is, as you very well know, because you talk about it on the show, is it's the switch between your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, mm -hmm. fight or flight versus rest. So if you ever find yourself in a stressful state, put your, give your heart a high five, put your hands on your heart, go, I'm okay, I'm safe, I'm loved. Repeat it 111 times if you need to. What you'll yeah. feel is you'll feel your nervous system start to settle. You'll feel yourself come back into your body. You'll feel your mind slow down. 
and you will literally take control of your nervous system. It is unbelievable. And it's also really important because, you know, I, in, in researching this book, I talked to, um, you know, the acclaimed Dr. Judy Willis, who's a, a incredible uh, neuroscientist. And she explained something that I never knew, but it makes a lot of sense. If your nervous system is on edge, it's in a like alert state, you're dysregulated, it's impossible for your cognitive function of your brain to work. Mm. I can give you an example. If somebody were to bust in here with a gun and try to rob us, yeah, would it. you be able to do a math problem? No. No. Be like, just thinking safety. Yes, yeah. exactly. Save my life. I can't, I, I bet the majority of people actually walk around with a nervous system Ooh. that is on edge like that, particularly post pandemic. Yeah. And for me, the reason why I've actually linked it all the way back. So when I was in the fourth grade, I was molested while I was sleeping by an older kid. Wow. And in the um, kind of array of things that can happen in terms of sexual abuse, mine was very tame. Yeah. Like it was a one-time incident. It was mm. a kid who was slightly older than me. It was confusing, not scary. I just possum disassociated, don't even remember how it ended. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, I didn't even remember it. And then I remembered it when I was 28 years old. And I believe that the reason why I have always woken up hmm. in a state on edge is because of that incident. Since the fourth grade. Yes. Wow. And the thing is, Lewis, is that I, you know, the morning's a trigger. If you have that stored in your body, something happened to you, something happened to you, something's wrong, something's wrong, because something was wrong. And you don't have the tools, and no kid does, to smooth out your nervous system and heal the trauma, that trauma lives in your body. Yes. And so I believe most self-sabotaging behavior that people continue to repeat is nothing but stored trauma. And your best ability to cope with it when it was happening. That's and, why we sabotage. Yes. So I don't think it's intentional. I really don't. Like even a, 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 somebody who's diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder, they don't know that they have that. Right. Like they're not in, like there's not, it's like such a program behavior. There's no, I'm going to go do that. I'm, I'm in love with this person. Let's go screw it up. Right. That's not what happens. And this is also why I'm telling you. I, I, I know I'm crazy passionate about this topic of this standing in front of the mirror and changing how you see yourself. If you don't get a hold of that story, I'm worthless, I'm unlovable, I screw everything up, I'm a bad person, I'm not good enough, nothing works out for me. If you don't change that and start cheering yourself forward, mm -hmm. you will stay locked in these self-sabotaging self patterns because you will act in a way that you believe it subconsciously or unconsciously. I know, it's heavy right. Oh, sorry, I keep sorry. It's all good, yeah. Man, so you're saying you're 52 right now, as you said? Yeah. So you're saying I have a lot of work to do still for the rest of my life. It doesn't well, I end, don't, huh? I don't, I don't actually, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you screwed up your life as much as I did. So I think it's like, and I don't know how much you torture yourself. Yeah. I'm really good at torturing myself, or at least I used to be. And so back to your original question about learning uh -huh. to love yourself, I also think that even if you're wildly successful, whether it's successful in your relationship or successful at work, a lot of us, the more successful we become, the harder we are on ourselves. Mm. We harp on the things that aren't going right instead of really focusing on the things that are going well. Yeah, we don't celebrate enough. Yes. It's just on to the next or what yes. What could have been more perfect or something yes. like that. Yeah. Uh-huh. What is that saying to ourselves when we don't celebrate the hard work we put in? You're not worthy of it. Mm. You haven't done enough. Even even this amazing podcast that you have is enough, Lewis. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll I'll high five you when uh you know I sell it for a hundred million dollars, or I'll high right. five you. Right? It it rings true because it's true. Yeah. Yeah. I I'm I'm not there yet. And somehow, if I celebrate this, am I going to get the big thing? Like, think about a marathon. So a marathon. I think life is a marathon. And if you've ever watched a marathon or run a marathon. 
I'm running one in a few months. Are right? you? My first one. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I'm a little, so terri- I'm a little terrified. Why? You've done it? Yeah, I've done, I run four of them. Well, run is a very aggressive. <laughs> Jog, run? Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like, you know, if, if, if over five hours can, you yeah. know. <laughs> okay, you finish. Yeah, yeah, I finish. I walk through the, you know, the, the water things. Uh-huh. And, but you're a big guy, so yeah, it might I'm be a, hard on your knees. That's what I'm saying, yeah. So here's the thing that you're going to love about it. Okay. Tell me. The entire time you're running, spectators are high-fiving you. It gets you through it. Yes. That's what I keep saying. I'm like, I feel like running alone is so not fun. If you can do a 13-mile training run. I did a 13-mile, yeah. Yes. A few months ago. Then you can run a marathon. Really? Well, because. It's just going to get you through it. Well, right? all of the people get you through it. Yes. The, 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 the every cheery, high five is a transfer of energy. It's a transfer of belief. Wow. It, it, it drips dopamine. It, 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 what did Dr. Raymond say? It actually... Uh, harnesses the the energy of celebration in your nervous system. Every high five says, "Keep going." It says, "I believe in you." It says, "You're gonna you're gonna get there." It makes you enjoy it. Right. The same thing happens in your bathroom mirror. Mm. If you have big goals, you better stand in front of that mirror and high five yourself every day, every single step of the way. Stop looking around and waiting for everybody else to do it. Start giving it to yourself and mm. you will be shocked at how much more quickly things start to happen, at how much mm. more joy you experience along the way, at how much more present you are. Yeah. It's wild. What's the difference between high-fiving yourself in the mirror versus high-fiving your partner or best friend or business you already partner? Do that. Yeah. You already do that. Yeah. You're already throwing all this energy at everybody else. Uh-huh. And then you get pissed off when it doesn't come back to you. Right. Yeah. Take some of that and give it back to yourself. Okay. Improve the connection you have with yourself. And this isn't about like pumping yourself up to think you're like the best person on the planet. This is like the baseline. This is literally being like, you know what? You're going to have an okay day. Let's go do this. Mm -hmm. You know what? I see you. I know this is hard. Keep going. I I know you're nervous to have this hard conversation with this person. I believe you can do it. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. Like it's just one little boost along the way. You know, if you think about the things that go viral, it's little kids in front of a mirror with their parents getting them to talk out. Believing themselves, yeah. Correct. We all know that's how we're supposed to feel. Mm-hmm. But we feel weird and cheesy practicing it? Right. Are you kidding me? Right. Uh, the other thing that goes viral, all these teachers that are high-fiving and fist-bumping kids with that's their true. handshakes as yeah, they go true. in, that's and the true. mirror one with the I am that just kind of went viral. Why do we all love that? Because we know each one of those kids just felt seen and felt good and felt motivated walking into that classroom. Mm-hmm. Start your day that way. Yeah, they feel empowered. Yes. It's easier to learn from a place of empowerment than Correct. negative self I'm glad self-talk. you're here. Yeah. I see you. Right. Glad you showed up today. Yeah. Let's go do this. That's cool. What's the hardest thing you've had to deal with with the negative thought process in your mind? Like, what's the most challenging thing in your life to, to overcome the, the negative thoughts. You mean like a specific situation? Like you've had a lot of success, you keep manifesting, but what's something, like what's the biggest struggle for you? Where you Currently? Where you give yourself negative self-talk. Like what's the thing you have to constantly try to overcome? Oh, that people are mad at me. Really? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah that people are mad at me. That's, or that, 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 uh, that I've done something wrong. It's actually, it's not that people are mad at me, it's that, that I've done something wrong. And so that's why people are mad at me. Yes. Oh. Yes, the default in my brain is I've done something wrong. It was really interesting when this book came out. I mean, you and I are fantastic friends. And we have, and we are super supportive of one another. Mm -hmm. Uh, And um, we share a lot of mutual friends. Yes. And I did not want to reach out to anybody that we are friends with and ask them to be on their podcast because I presumed everybody would say no. Why? Uh, I have this default setting that I've done something wrong, that you're Mm. secretly mad at me, that you would feel that it's a sense of obligation, Mm. and that I would be imposing myself, and it would be this weird thing. Like, this is a complete just play that goes on in my mind. Completely, completely. And I don't know if I'll ever get rid of it. Really? Yeah. But it gets quieter and quieter and quieter. Mm-hmm. I kind of laugh at him. I'm like, oh, for God's sakes, just text him. I mean, he's either going to yeah. say no or whatever. Um, and 
But it is something that I struggle with for sure. Interesting. Yeah, like this deep. Where do you think it comes from? Um, I don't know. I, I think it comes from. Like if I had to, if I had to really unpack it, like maybe it comes from having a mom that was nineteen and who didn't have her family around her, mm. and who probably was dealing with a lot of fear and grief and. Um, my dad was in medical school and she was working nights for the IRS. Both their families were on the East Coast. They were in the middle of Kansas. I can only imagine how overwhelming and anxiety ridden it must have been. And what we know now, I mean, that book that Oprah did with Dr. Bruce Perry about the, what happens in your development from basically zero to eight months, I feel like that probably had a big impact. Not anything intentional, but just like how stressed out things must have been. Like I, I, did, I recently, my husband and I recently did a guided MDMA mm -hmm. uh, therapy session for trauma. It was one of the most life-changing things wow. I've ever experienced. Mm. And um, I've heard remember, great things about MDMA. Oh, it's unbelievable. It suspends, I, I'm ter I, there's no way in hell I'm ever doing ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. I don't need to poop or puke or right, any right. of that stuff. And I also feel like if I did ayahuasca, there would be monsters all over the place. It would be a horror show. And the thing that would come out of it is me going, I can get myself through anything. Yeah. That's what the drug taught me. Yeah. And I don't feel like I need yeah. to have a really scary trip in order to make I've, that happen. I have no desire, yeah. But MDMA, I will shout from the rooftops. It suspends the amygdala, which is the fear center of the brain, so you do not have mm. the scary response. And so we did this incredible thing. We were together having separate experiences. We laid down on these uh, mats. They made a six hour playlist. You put a blindfold on and the music guides you. And as the drug took a hold, and my intention was I wanted to look back on my life and see all the good. And it was because I tend to, like everybody, focus on kind of the bad stuff. Mm -hmm. And not that there's been a lot of bad stuff either. And so, I mean, if anything, I had an amazing childhood. I, I had, my parents are still married. They're still in the house I grew up in. I grew up in a tiny, amazing little town in the Midwest. Um, super close family, like yeah, yeah. whatever. But yeah. I still think the trauma that gets stored in your nervous system is very individual, whether it's a critical parent or you're just hard on yourself or it's generational mm -hmm. crap that gets passed down. We are all healing something whether it's ours or it's yes. our grandmothers that got passed down through your mother and on to you. And so um, the, the, the music takes hold and the very first vision, it was almost like being on a roller coaster and it takes a turn like Space Mountain and then you come onto a scene of your life. Mm. And there I was on our lake, Bear Lake in North Muskegon, Michigan with Jody Bricken, my best friend from elementary school and we were ice skating. Hmm. And I was there, Lewis. Wow. I was in the scene. And then as the song ends and, and you go into a different one, it takes you to a different part of your subconscious. And wait to hear this. I was sitting in a baby carriage. And the first vision was, well, actually, I didn't know I was in a, in a, in a little bassinet. I was looking up at the sky. And it was this beautiful sky with these big white clouds. And there were these kites wow. flying all over the place. And then I looked over. And across from me were my parents. And they were so young. Mm. My mom had this beautiful pixie haircut that she had when she had me, and my dad had a perm, you know. My mom used to give him a perm um, back in the late 60s. And I was filled with so much love. And I was also filled with so much empathy mm. for how alone they were. Mm -hmm. It was them against the world. Yeah. And that really shifted something in me in terms of that experience and how I see, like, look, I love my folks. My mom and I have the kind of relationship. She's one of my favorite human beings and we can stand each other for about three days. Mm -hmm. And then we literally want to kill each other. Right. Um, and I think as a kid, I made it my job that she was okay. Mm -hmm. If she was unhappy, I tried to make her happy, which only made her unhappy. And so I feel like my tendency in relationships is to try to make everybody okay.
Mm-hmm. And um, which constantly me leaves me feeling like I'm not okay. Or if they're not okay, I'm not okay. That there's something wrong. Right. I've done something wrong. Right. And so, and it's a very common pattern, by the way. This is like about as classic as it gets. That doesn't mean there's anything horrible that necessarily happened. It's just that as human beings, we are energetically intertwined with one another. And so what was interesting is after this incredible experience, which is literally like watching the movie reel of your life, Mm. I have experienced almost no dysregulation in my nervous system. I had an experience the other night, we ordered from P.F. Chang's and we ordered everything and I have one daughter who's like, gluten-free this and da 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 and da 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 And she comes barreling into the room and tries a bite of hers and is like, this is terrible. And then picks up my husband's thing and leaves. And normally that would send me into like, wah, you self it, wah. And I felt the volcano come to uh, my ankles. Yeah. And then I very calmly said, hey, Ken, uh, that's dad's. Could you put it back? And you can have what you ordered or just make something else, but don't take that. Yeah, yeah. Like I didn't need to erupt. And so that was one impact that it's had, no, which is great. incredible. That's great. And I, we only did this a couple months ago. Mm. And then the second thing that um, happened afterwards, I called my mom and I said, you know, I had this vision because I didn't know. And I said, you know, we were, I, all I could see were kites. And she said, oh, that's Kansas City. There was a park we used to go to. Wow. Is that not crazy? That's crazy. Yeah, so I think that huh. sort of default, there's something wrong, mm-hmm. comes from just energetically hardwired into. Right, are people around me, are they upset at me? Are they upset yeah. in general? That and I also fault? think this stuff is generational. Yeah. You know, when I think about, you know, my, I come from a long line of very hardworking farmers. And, you know, mm. my, my dad's side of the family uh, owned a, a, a bakery, immigrants. And, you know, it's not an easy life. No, it's not. Not an easy life at all. Working hard all yeah. day, yeah. your whole life. Uh, there's a strategy that I started doing when I was broke. Uh, I, was like, I was like, I could really make, you know, start making some money. You know, I could really start making some money. And someone said, um, money comes to you when you're ready for it. And mm. I was like, I feel pretty ready. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I could use some of that money right now. I don't like feeling broke. But I said, you know what? I'm going to start looking at the world as if I see money everywhere. <gasps> yes, yes. And I start. I literally start like I find money all the time. I see twenty dollar bills, hundred dollar bills. I found like just on the street randomly. I see quarters and nickels and dollars. Start with a penny. You could do this with long. a heart. You could do this with a heart rock. Yes. His yes. mind is open to it. You yes. are. This is how you train your mind. You mm-hmm. basically tell it what you want. By saying this is important to me. Start looking for it. You'll yes. start seeing it. Yes. And by the way, this is also why it's important to do that thing where you're like, boom, I found it. See? Yes. And then it makes your mind do more. This is why it comes back to the positive affirmation. I'm, if you yes. start to high five yourself and tell yourself that you deserve to be happy and you deserve to be fulfilled, you will start to see reasons for it. That's it. I started doing this when uh, I was single at one point and I said, I'm gonna start attracting the most incredible, like amazing women in my life, whether it just be friendships or romantic, I'm gonna meet That's great exactly women. when I walked into your life. I'm like exactly. his older sister. Yeah, yes, exactly. In Rocks, Mel Robinson. But you just start finding these, you start recognizing what you want, you start seeing it, and then you start attracting it more frequently. Whether mm-hmm. it's, you know, a heart that you're looking for, whether it's pennies, like you'll start finding it and you'll start to manifest more of those things in your life. So in the book, The High Five Habit, Take Control of Your you Life. You wanna hear a crazy story? Yes, go ahead. Heart? Go ahead. Okay. So I got to say what chapter this is because everybody's yes. going to ask you and I don't really know. Yes. Um, this is one of the most extraordinary stories ever. <laughs> oh, 189. Okay. Oh, no, that's the page number. It's chapter 14. Okay. Okay. You ready for this? Yes. It's incredible. Is this so this the is jeal- a story. Is this the jealousy part or no? No. Okay. Oh, this, oh, do you want to talk about jealousy? <laughs> no, go ahead, go ahead. I'll talk about jealousy no, and how ahead. I write about you in the book. That's what I was And how jealous I am of you. <laughs> no. It's true. Don't I am jealous don't. of you. I am. So here's the thing I want everybody to understand. We all have jealousy wrong. Uh You have been taught to believe that jealousy is a bad thing. Right. Jealousy is only a bad thing if you wallow in it and let it kill you. Yes. Jealousy is a great thing if you understand it. And if you use it as a tool to move forward. Yes. Right. You can only be jealous of the things that are meant for you. Ooh, that's interesting. Yeah. 
Like, I'm not jealous of somebody who lives on a ranch in Montana. I don't want to do that right now. Right. I'm not jealous at all. Right. I'm not jealous of somebody who lives in a penthouse apartment in New York City. I don't, I don't want that right now. Mm -hmm. You can only be jealous of things that are meant for you. Hmm. Jealousy is blocked desire. Hmm. And it builds when you don't take action toward it. More and more. Yes. You resent them. Yes. You, yes. And so you aim all this stuckness huh. that you've created because you will not give yourself permission to take action. Why? Because you don't think you're worthy. You don't think you deserve it. You think you're too late. The negative self-talk in the mirror stops you dead in your tracks. And so you become buried alive in jealousy. Mm -hmm. Goes back to this high five. Give yourself permission to have the things that you desire. Let your jealousy, like I'm jealous of Lewis because he started his podcast way back when. He's freaking amazing at it. He's got this like unbelievable impact. Every single day I wake up and I'm like, I love Lewis. I hate Lewis. I love Lewis. <laughs> off Lewis. I love Lewis. Like, why is it Lewis and not me? Why did right. Lewis do it? Why was Lewis the one sleeping on somebody's couch and started a podcast? Why? <laughs> I was doing radio back in 2009. This should be me, sure. right? I have a desire mm. to launch a podcast. So you're launching one now? Yes. That's We're good. in the middle of it. <laughs> yes. Good. Yeah. I shook my hand so hard, like I got that like weird thing that happens with your finger when you like <laughs> jam it. So no, you got to give yourself permission to feel jealousy and then just unpack it. Well, what is it that I'm jealous of? And it's the fact that you have a podcast. Mm -hmm. And so I got two choices. Let that shit out me or do something about do it. it. Let it go or let it go. Either yes. Let it go and stop letting it haunt you. Yes. Or go take action. Yeah, either take action and go earn it uh -huh. and do it your way. Mm -hmm. Or... Let it eat you alive. Mm -hmm. Those are your two choices. Because the other thing about desire and the things that are meant for you, they never leave you. Mm. Somebody who's always dreamt of doing oh, something man, will I'll always dream of something. For 20 years, this is a good example. And then we got to get to the final questions because you got to leave here in a few minutes. But for 20 years, I every year, I've had the desire to learn Spanish. Oh my God, I have the same thing. If you're going to tell me that you've learned Spanish, <laughs> this is another reason why I'm jealous. jealous of you. For 20 years, I've had the desire, and every year I start to attempt it, and then I quit because it gets too hard. Because it's just not... You, you and I are dyslexic. Yes, it's very challenging for Foreign me. Foreign languages you know. for dyslexia is very difficult. I mean, English is challenging. Are you me. telling me you know Spanish now? I'm learning Spanish. So here's what I, here's what I said to myself. For a year now, I said, okay... I know this is not going to happen overnight like it, like athletics happens for me or where it's like quick for me to learn something. I know this has been a struggle in the past, but I'm going to start, I'm going to invest in a coach, uh, a teacher, a tutor. I'm going to work on my time. I'm going to do it the times I can do it. I do it three days a week right now. It's only an hour at a time, three days a week. So it's three hours a week. It's not that much. It's not full immersion. It's not six months and I'm fluent. It's just like the slow process. Yep, yep, okay. But you're doing it. But I'm doing it. I've been doing it for a year. And I still feel like a year later, man, I'm like, do I even know any of this? I still have those moments. But I also know I'm way better than I was a year ago. Yes. I understand a lot. I understand a lot more. And I feel way more confident. And I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to enjoy the process and keep enjoying it. If it takes That's me 10 years. That's a high years, five attitude, dude. If it takes me 10 years, it'll take me 10 years. That's right. If it takes me five years, three. Hopefully it doesn't. But it's the process of I'm showing up consistently I'm seeing the rain and the 5 a.m. on my vision board for Spanish. That, <laughs> and I'm saying, you know what? I'm just going to keep showing up consistently and yeah. little, little wins at yeah, a time. Yeah, I'm embarrassed, but I'm saying it anyway. Yeah. I don't know the word. I'm asking for help, Celebr like all that but stuff. But I'm celebrating the moment. And in three to five years, I'll be thanking myself. Yes. Because I'll be fluent. Yes. And, 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 and the difference is we gave up every because i've started a million times give too. it up for 20 years and i said i'm not giving up anymore right because it was still the desire was still there correct I it doesn't to, leave you i dude. need to kill the desire and say i'm done with this dream like i let it go and i'm I'll not just, willing to do it yeah yeah or, or i gotta actually start doing something correct it took me 20 years to start doing this correct. one and it's not effortless overnight but it's i'm making it fun i'm showing up and well let's use the marathon analogy yes if you are celebrating yourself and encouraging and empowering yourself every single step of the way and you're mm -hmm. keeping a high five yes. attitude about it mm -hmm. every single day when you wake up, you will keep going with Absolutely. the Spanish. Yeah. You and I kept quitting because the moment it got hard, we said, screw this, I can't do screw it. Screw it. Yeah. We gave up. Yeah. We stopped cheering ourselves forward. Absolutely. It's a muscle.
It is. Yeah. yeah. And we, well, I'll tell you the painting story the next time I'm on because I can't tell it without perfect, crying. Perfect. It's okay. amazing. Tell me the next time. Um, people can go get the book. I got a couple final questions. They can get the book, The High Five Habit, Take Control of Your Life with One Simple Habit. Simple high five in the mirror. Just boom. Just boom. Little, Boom with yourself. That's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, you also have a challenge. And yes. I'm, and I've got a link I'm going to send people to. You just go to lewishouse.com slash mel, and it'll send you to the high five challenge. Lewis is doing it. That's yes, right. Yes, I'll be doing it. Five it's days, five million people, Lewis. Five Start day, their day with this stuff. It's a five-day challenge. So you that's can join it's super the free. It's easy. It's easy. It's free. It's fun. Uh, and it'll help you build self-confidence, momentum, all that stuff. So make sure you get a couple copies of the book. This is going to be a game changer for a long time for many people. You are I believe that. You see, the five second rule, it helped you get moving. Yes. And this This will keep you going. No. This goes deeper. What's it do? Helps you believe in yourself. It helps you stop the self hatred and the self doubt. Yes. That keeps you from doing what you need to do. The five second rule is a hack that helps you find instant courage and motivation. This fundamentally changes how you see yourself. Oh, that's good. That's what we need. Because if you don't learn to love yourself, it's going to be hard to keep going. Yeah. You can go for a day or two days, but it's hard to be consistent when it's, when it's painful. Most people go through life not loving themselves. Right. I thought I did. I you really thought did. you loved yourself. I really did. But the truth is, I was not actually demonstrating it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was doing it by eating the right stuff and you know taking care of my body and being very loving and nurturing to my kids and... Uh, going to therapy, but in terms of that intimate moment with myself and how I viewed myself, I still saw what was wrong. Mm -hmm. I still saw a person who needed fixing, Mm. a person who had screwed up. And what I see now is somebody that I love. That's good. It's beautiful. Yeah. I think that's hard for a lot of people. Everyone. So I'm I'm proud of you for doing that because it's not easy. I'm not done. Like tomorrow, I could wake up and be like, <laughs> like, like, so okay, like, okay, high five, come on, not with a negative. Uh, again, people can get the book, uh, melrobbins.com, Mel Robbins everywhere on social media, lewishouse.com slash mel to get the free challenge. Um, Audio book as well, which is going to be powerful. They can go to Audible and check that out. This is going to be a big book for a long time, so I want people to get this. Um, I think so. It's the thing I'm the most proud of, Lewis, that I've ever put out. I'm excited for you. Very excited. It's a great book. Thanks. Uh, I asked you this question before. I'm going to ask it again just so we have it and see what your, your response is from a few years later now. This is called The Three Truths. So imagine it's your last day on earth many years away from now and you've accomplished all your dreams. But for whatever reason, you've got to take all of your work with you. So people don't have your books. This podcast is gone. Your videos, your content, it's all gone to another place but you get to leave behind three lessons to the world, three things you know to be true from all of your experiences of life, and this is all we have of your body of work. What would you say are those three lessons or three truths for you? Oh, well, for sure. Um, The most important relationship you have in life is the one you have with yourself. Mm -hmm. So treat yourself like the most important person in your life. The second one is um, I think what we talked about today that, um, oh, I know, we didn't talk about this. (laughs) This is part of the high five attitude. This has saved my This moment is preparing me for something amazing that hasn't Mm -hmm. happened yet. Mm -hmm. That saying, which I deeply believe because life is the greatest school you will ever attend, hence we're at the School of Greatness, mm-hmm. man. Um, it anchors me down in hope, optimism, and faith, no matter what's happening. It is like a mental high five. And it has always borne out that there's always a skill or an experience or a life lesson or a person that I have gained in every horrible thing that's ever Mm -hmm. happened to me or because of me that has prepared me for something amazing that's coming. Mm -hmm. And then the final thing is for sure the five second rule. Um, And the application I, I would want people to know is that 
you can five, four, three, two, one, and interrupt any thought you don't want to think. And that will give you immediate control over yeah. what you think next. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, oh, and I know. And don't put too much MCT oil in your coffee or else you will literally have an accident <laughs> trying to hike. Yes. You'll crap yourself, crap your pants. <laughs> True story. Um, before I ask the final question, I want to acknowledge you for being an amazing friend. You're a great friend to, my, to me and to so many people. And I acknowledge you for constantly showing up because I know you go through a lot of different challenges, a lot of different weight in your life, pressures. And the fact that you constantly show up in service of creating a book like this and creating content for people so that they can overcome the crap in their life is a beautiful thing. So I acknowledge you for mm -hmm. being a symbol of inspiration and constantly showing up even when it seems like there's a lot going on in your life. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. And Louis, let me acknowledge you for something. Okay. You have been uh, such an amazing friend to me. I'm going to get emotional probably. Pull it back. Um, you have been so open mm. and so um, generous with your friendship and with um, your wisdom. Mm -hmm. Both the wisdom that comes from doing great and the wisdom that co comes from being shitty. Mm -hmm. And um, you have allowed me to experience what it feels like to be considered a really good friend. Mm. I appreciate it. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See, we're all crying. Making me emotional here. Okay. <laughs> Final question. What's your definition of greatness? Oh. This moment right now. Two friends fully present with one another. Yeah. Sharing and doing life together. There you go. I love you. High five. Woo! Love you. I love you. <laughs> I just didn't want to suffer anymore. That was really the moment for me. Yes. Like I sought the truth. I was seeking the truth because I wanted a way out of suffering. And you know, I've got an incredible life. But what I talk when I when I talk about suffering, what I mean is suffering from the mind, not suffering from what's happening in the world. Yeah. Suffering from the mind. So